Making chicken in there. A lab-grown chicken nugget. Chicken grown in a lab. Why are people making it? Climate change. Better for the environment. The environment. Lab meat is not going to save the planet or the animals. So then why has $3 billion been invested into lab meat startups? Well, to understand the full picture, we'll first have to take a look at the science of why scaling lab meat is not practical at all. Second, we'll look at why no one will be able to afford it. Third, why it could be worse for the environment. And finally, whether the public and investors are being misled by unrealistically optimistic stories. This meat, it's incredibly unsustainable, but we figured out a way to solve it. And we're gonna have to do it if we wanna continue living on this planet. So either we accept this or we all become vegetarian. It's better for the world. At first, I was really optimistic about lab meat. It made so much sense. Growing just a steak instead of a whole cow seemed to be way more efficient. But then I started looking into it, and it made less and less sense. To take cells from a cow or chicken and grow them quickly, they need to be put in a very expensive custom-made bioreactor, filled with a specially formulated liquid made with purified water, growth factors, purified amino acids, glucose, and salts. A cow just needs rainwater and grass. The facility and the bioreactor need to be totally sterile because a tiny amount of bacteria or virus could ruin the whole batch, wasting tons of money. A cow has an immune system, so it can just lay in the dirty grass outside. A huge challenge to growing cells quickly inside of a bioreactor is developing ways to efficiently deliver oxygen and nutrients to each cell while removing waste products like ammonia, lactate, and CO2. A cow, on the other hand, handles all this really easily with lungs, blood vessels, and its liver. There's a lot more to this picture, but the point is it's very expensive to try and do what a cow, chicken, or pig does. In a Singapore restaurant, there's a recent addition to the menu. This is chicken, but not as we know it. The lab meat company Eat Just was actually selling lab-grown chicken nuggets straight to consumers in Singapore. But those cost upwards of $50 each to make. For that same price, about 1,500 nuggets could be made from conventional chicken meat. The most common justification for lab meat is that we need it to prevent conventional meat from destroying the planet. And what is the problem that we try to solve by cultivated meat? So that we, we have a planet to inhabit. President Biden signed an executive order this year requiring federal agencies to support cultivating alternative food sources. Ezra Klein, founder of the hugely popular news media company Vox, wrote an article arguing that we need government funding into plant-based protein and lab meat to save the planet from climate change. And we need government support to get there. But you're getting all these people like pushing the government to fund this. Uh, it's, as soon as you show me it's better for the environment and there's like positive impacts, let's fund it. It's fine. But I do not see that. On the other hand, Dr. Derek Reisner points out in his PhD dissertation that despite all the hype and investment that has already been poured into lab meat, a detailed assessment of whether lab meat is actually better for the environment has not been properly done. We're going to need all hands on deck to make these the global meat industry. One report commissioned by the Good Food Institute, GFI, a nonprofit which heavily promotes and supports the lab meat space, admitted that it would cost $450 million to make a facility producing a mere 22 million pounds of lab meat a year. That does sound like a lot, but if this steak represents the 100 billion pounds of normal meat that the US makes a year, this represents 22 million pounds, a mere 0.022% of US meat production. And 450 million is the extra optimistic price tag. Another analysis put the cost of such a facility closer to 5 billion. What that would mean is that even if we assume that lab meat has zero emissions, if we wanted to reduce global emissions by 1 20th of 1%, we would first need to invest at least a trillion dollars just into the facilities for lab meat. This is Dr. Paul Wood, an ex-biopharma consultant and board member of Cellular Agriculture Australia. Uh, sustainability credentials will have to be earned. They can't just be assumed. I understand the, the energy intensities. I mean, you're running a whole lot of tanks at 37 degrees. They produce a lot of then radiant heat. So they actually have to air condition your rooms. If you're not using completely renewable energy, you won't be more sustainable. It sounds too good to be true because it is too good to be true.
In 2021, Joe Fassler published a bombshell article in The Counter that laid out the specific technical details illustrating why lab meat is very likely a pipe dream. There are multiple breakthroughs that are needed, vast advances that would be worthy of Nobel Prizes, multiple Nobel Prizes. One of the many experts Fassler consulted with was David Humbert, a chemical engineer who wrote the most detailed analysis of scaling lab meat yet. Even in the most generous, best case, hypothetical scenario Humbert considered, where various economies of scale are included and all kinds of technological scientific breakthroughs are assumed to have happened. He projected that lab meat in the future would still be very, very unlikely to cost under $11 per pound to produce. With markup, that would easily be over $22 a pound at the supermarket. That's over four times the price of normal ground beef. Humbert honestly was being nice in his work. It's, I've, I've talked to Dave. I've talked to Dave Humbert. He was trying to make it work and he, he freaking couldn't. <laughs> like, he's straight up. He's, a, he's not going to do things that aren't factual. In Vox's Netflix documentary, they said that Mosa Meat says it cut production costs to just $10 a burger. But I contacted that company and they said they didn't get down to $10 a burger. They said that $10 a burger was simply a target set in 2019. So why is it so damn expensive? Again, the problem is not growing a bunch of lab meat. It's growing it for cheap so that people will actually buy it. It's not as simple as scaling up your equipment. It has to do with biological limits. For example, humans exist, but you can't have a 10 foot tall human. You can have a really big animal, but you can't have a really big animal with a really fast metabolic rate. You can grow cells outside of an animal in a large bioreactor, but you can't do it efficiently. If you want to grow just the beef we eat cheaply and efficiently, you need the rest of that cow. Two huge problems limiting efficient cell growth in a bioreactor are getting enough oxygen and nutrients to the cells and transporting CO2 and waste products away from the cells. First, mammals' complex vascular system is responsible for delivering oxygen and nutrients to all of their cells. It's arranged in an intricate fractal pattern such that all 100 trillion cells are within a mere 500 microns of a small capillary. With lab meat, the cells are just dumped in a liquid that has the nutrients they need, and the mixture is just stirred around to help expose all the cells to those nutrients. Oxygen is delivered to the cells by blowing bubbles into the tank. This nutrient liquid they use in bioreactors is only able to carry an amount of oxygen that is 45 times less than what real blood can carry. By the way, this nutrient liquid is currently so expensive and resource intensive that Dr. Derek Reisner's analysis suggests that lab meat may have a much higher environmental impact than normal meat. It's not good for the environment, which I don't think it is. It's not economically viable, which it my own research is like, I don't know how you guys are going to make this economically viable. The pharmaceutical industry has been using tons and tons of bioreactors to make all sorts of products for decades now. Globally, about 23% of all drugs are made in bioreactors. If we're going to start using bioreactors for meat, we are going to need a ton of them. Pretend this represents the global meat demand. This is half of 1%. That is how much lab meat we would get if we had 11 to 22 times the entire pharmaceutical industry's current stainless steel bioreactor capacity just for growing lab meat. How many reactors you would need if you were to see a really significant replacement of, of current meat consumption? That's one hell of a lot of steel. Take the type of steel that you would need to make these tanks. You got to mine all that. You got to get it out of the ground. You have to process it. Where do these tanks come from? As part of normal cell metabolism, CO2 and waste products like ammonia and lactate are produced by the cells. It's almost like the cells are sitting in their own urine. When too much of these things build up in the tank, the cells don't do too well, and it reduces the rate that the cells grow. At some point, the cell growth will slow to a halt, and your cells will die from bathing in all that urine. So before that happens, you need to harvest your cells and start a new batch. David Humbert explains in his 2021 paper that biological limits like this are more often the issue than physical limits like tank size. Meaning you could have a 250,000 liter tank, but it would be completely worthless if your cells stopped growing at only 20,000 liters because of too much CO2 or ammonia building up. In the case of a cow, its bloodstream would simply transfer the CO2 away from the cells to the lungs to be breathed out, and ammonia and lactate would be transported to the liver to get rid of it. With bioreactors, there is a process called perfusion, which can clear out some of the CO2 and ammonia, which will improve the cell growth. 
But that equipment is way too expensive to use for making millions of pounds of lab meat. Humbert calculates that even though you are growing the cells more efficiently, it would cost even more, driving up the cost of lab meat an extra $6 per pound. This is just one of the many problems that need to be solved to make lab meat cheap enough for the average person to buy. You know, the papers that people like the Good Food Institute have put out, they, they actually have stated the cost has to come down over 1,000 fold. When I was in leading discovery in a large pharmaceutical company, if I went forward and said, here's our product and it's a thousand fold away, that's a get out, get out of the room. I mean, come back when you've got something real. But is lab meat even meat? It is 100% meat. Because it will taste like animal meat because that's exactly what it is. The result is actual animal flesh. First of all, what usually comes out of these bioreactors is called cell slurry. Slurry of cells, right? That's what's coming out of a bioreactor. It's, it's not the most appetizing uh, thing. I call our product Little Lisa's Patented Animal Slurry. A spoonful of slurry will cure what ails ya. Most future lab meat products will be blended with other non-meat ingredients and formed into homogenized things like burger patties, nuggets, sausages, meatballs, and hot dogs. We're not going to come out with a steak, we're going to come out with a hamburger. Mm -hmm. So it's a structured stuff. Real meat is composed of various types of cells. It has its familiar texture thanks to both muscle fibers and fat cells as well as blood vessels, tendons, connective tissues, and so on. But bioreactors typically can only cultivate one type of cell at a time meaning an entirely different process will be needed to assemble various cells and additives together into a texture that resembles something like a steak or pork chop. So the price is even more important because while someone might pay top dollar for a T-bone steak, they're not going to pay $20 a pound for mashy ground beef. Several of the compounds that contribute to the flavor and nutritional profile of meat arrive there thanks to processes going on elsewhere in the animal's body. These things don't just appear in the cells. So to match real meat, various nutrients and compounds will need to be added one by one at some point in the process of making lab meat. In the end, when I've got a cell paste, I don't have any structure. I actually need some fibrous material, so I'll blend in some plant material. I think in the end, cell-based meat will be the new plant-based category because I'm going to guess that there's probably going to be more plant-based material in those products than there is cell-based. The point is, a lot of work will need to be done to get consumers to actually like it as much as real meat. The lab meat industry has a history of making promises they can't keep. In 2021, Mother Jones published an illustration of the many, many predictions made by research institutions and lab meat companies about when lab meat would be available. That ended up being wrong. As you're building a business, don't be naive about the power of storytelling. You need them to give you money when all you have is a PowerPoint deck. This is Josh Hoffman. He was the CEO of the synthetic biology company Zymergen. His skill of painting a vision for the future earned Zymergen $1 billion of venture capital. Zymergen is rewriting the potential of biology. Our work has the potential to revolutionize chemicals and materials, agriculture, human health, so we really think this has the potential for to change the entire economy. He had an optimistic vision of reducing our reliance on petrochemicals by producing everyday products like anything from optic film to mosquito repellent in bioreactors. These bioreactors would be filled with microbes, specially engineered to produce specific compounds we regularly rely on petrochemicals for. But the challenge was the same as lab meats. How would they ever do this at scale for a reasonable price? Zymergen went public in April 2021. But just four months later, they announced that they would bring in zero dollars in product revenue for 2021 and 2022. CEO Josh Hoffman ended up leaving Zymergen in August of 2021. And by July of 2022, 94% of the company's stock value had vanished since going public. A former employee said that Josh Hoffman misled people with exaggerated financial figures and made overly optimistic projections about the company's capabilities. One of the big players in the lab meat space, Eat Just, has raised over $800 million in venture capital. Has recently faced a slew of negative coverage, accusing it of classic Silicon Valley hubris and overreach. Eat Just came under scrutiny in 2016 when they sent many of their workers into grocery stores to buy out tons of their vegan mayonnaise product. Hundreds of jars of its own products. Here you go, folks. Yeah. Here's the extra mayonnaise you ordered. A former scientist at the company said that this type of behavior was common. And the company's entire board stepped down last month with little explanation. Just because you can do something in the lab 
does not at all mean you can do something at commercial scale. But in 2022, he just made the impressive announcement that they will be building 10 never before seen 250,000 liter bioreactors. People say, oh, we're going to grow 250,000 liters. I don't think that's feasible. I don't think it's feasible by a from a biological point of view. He just claims that 250,000 liter bioreactors will be able to produce 30 million pounds of meat a year by 2030. These big numbers may wow investors and earn them more investment, but even if everything goes perfectly to plan, their magic facility would replace a mere 0.03% of the United States conventional meat production. Even Yakov Nakhmia, CEO of the lab meat company Believer Meats, says that a quarter of a million liter bioreactor is just a fantasy. And there was the talk about, you know, a quarter of a million liter bioreactor is our and they dripping in garbage. Nakimas explains that while a bigger bioreactor would help scale the production, it makes the cell growing process less efficient. The bioreactor is small, full, and then your factory is not going to be efficient. The problem is that the bigger the bioreactor is, the more non homogeneous it becomes. The process becomes less efficient. There's a, been a contamination. Something got into the lab. Another huge difficulty with massive lab meat plants is that they need to be exceedingly clean. A bioreactor doesn't have an immune system to protect the fragile animal cells, so if the tiniest bit of bacteria, virus, or other contaminant on a worker's glove or clothing gets into these massive bioreactors, the entire batch of cell slurry would be ruined. This is a well-known million dollar problem with bioreactors in the pharmaceutical industry. He was telling us about the uh million dollar club they lost a batch because of contamination so there's dudes walking around san francisco that because they contaminated a tank joined the million dollar club he said you only get to join it once you do it again you're, you're gone some people have used the misleading analogy that a lab meat facility will basically be like a beer brewery kind of like brewing beer or growing yogurt it's not that dissimilar from how you would culture food or how you would brew beer it's your friendly neighborhood meat brewery do you know how to make beer so you'll know how to make cultured meat. That is not the same. That drives me nuts. <laughs> we know that this isn't like brewing beer. Beer can be made in your backyard while you're smoking a cigarette and wearing the same sweaty clothes you had been wearing at the gym. An extra clean lab meat facility handling the same volume as a beer brewery could be well over six times the price due to all the measures necessary to keep it clean. Like, for example, level six and level eight clean rooms that constantly purify the air. I don't think it's a backyard operation. This is a sophisticated technology. The people who operate these facilities get paid very, very well, and they're mm. very well qualified because you cannot afford to get your cells contaminated. Back in 2017, when Eat Just was selling vegan mayo products, all of their products were pulled off of the retailer Target's shelves after allegations of food safety problems like listeria and salmonella contamination at the manufacturing facility. So let's hope that they're able to keep their lab meat facilities cleaner or they could be wasting millions of dollars. When talking to Joe Fassler, Dr. David Humbert summed up the feasibility of scaling lab-grown meat as a big wall of no. He even said that it was a fractal no, that the big no is comprised of many smaller no's. Derek Reisner has written two papers that point out the extreme cost and resource intensity of preparing that nutrient liquid, the growth medium for the cells. He agrees with Humbert's assessment that lab meat is a big wall of no. Yeah, I, I would say with the big wall now, I'm, I'm on that, that, that boat for sure. However, in late 2022, Yakov Nakmias, founder of Believer Meats, announced that his team's new work growing cells in the lab had conclusively shattered Humbert's so-called big wall of no. This is pretty big. After I read about this, I thought I might have to just rewrite this entire video. Believer Meat's approach is to increase the number of cells in the bioreactor by getting rid of those toxic waste products like ammonia and lactate that we talked about earlier. More cells in the bioreactor means more meat at a lower cost. In their experiment, they used a perfusion device. It's kind of like an artificial liver that pumps fluid in and out of the bioreactor and clears out the toxins. They claim that their protocol using this perfusion device allowed them to get a number of cells per liter that is way higher than what Humbert said would be possible. That sounds really exciting at first, but these results were done in a mere two liter bioreactor. If we're talking about what can be done at very small scale in the lab, this isn't actually new at all. Another team already achieved similar cell growth results way back in 2013. 
and it was with less resource intensive equipment. So an experiment in a two liter tank doesn't really tell you much. To mass produce lab meat at commercial scale, we need bioreactors that handle thousands of liters. Like, is it reasonable at all to say a, a two liter experiment is gonna scale to a thousand liter or 10,000 liter bioreactor? Look, I, I think with this sort of technology, no. I think, I think you've got to be very careful about claims you make on scaling. Derek Risner pointed out that the pharmaceutical industry will often attempt to scale in multiples of four. So if you achieve two liters in the lab, the next step is to run an experiment at eight liters. You don't just jump from two liters in the lab to commercial scale of a thousand liters. And when it comes to cost, Dr. Nakamas himself acknowledges that using this type of perfusion technology is so expensive that it's not appropriate for commercial scale production of lab meat. One of the things that, that they said in the Food Navigator article was like, this conclusively shatters the limits set forth by Humbert. To say that it's shattered, I think that is um, a, a pretty big overstep. And I think it's the sort of things we're seeing from a lot of companies because they're still capital raising. Mm -hmm. So you always have to be positive. The way the, the general media reports on cultured meat is through the lens of investment. This company just raised $40 million. This, this company just raised $140 million. And some of the off the record conversations I've had with, with people within the industry, they're like, listen, investors do not do their due diligence. Some of them like couldn't pass a biology class. Last year, Dr. Jeffrey Lee Funk published an article titled, Fake It Till You Make It is an old trick Silicon Valley startups use to get money. He explains a cycle of how startups are often overly optimistic to the point of misleading investors into investing. But even then, people see that investment as evidence that the company is likely to succeed, which drives more investment. Bruce Friedrich is the CEO and founder of the earlier mentioned Good Food Institute. He's featured in Ezra Klein's article saying public investment in lab-grown meat is urgently needed. Joe Fassler wrote in his article that when Friedrich was skeptically questioned by Ricardo San Martin, who has a PhD in biotechnology, Friedrich snapped back saying that the proof that people have invested is proof that scaling lab meat is practical. There is a surprising number of overfunded house of cards startups today. As laid out by Dr. Jeffrey Lee Funk, just to name a few, Uber has raised $25 billion, but their cumulative losses are $32 billion. WeWork raised $21 billion with cumulative losses of $20.7 billion. Even Ginkgo Bioworks, which has acquired the earlier mentioned company Zymergen, has raised $800 million, but has cumulative losses of $3.3 billion. Throwing money at companies doesn't make them profitable, so why should we assume that throwing money at lab meat will make it cheap to produce? One reason why that perfusion technology is so expensive is that it uses tons of that expensive growth medium. The cost of growth medium has been a concern for the bioprocessing industry for decades. If anybody could make a super cheap yet effective medium, then they would be rich just from that. Yet various lab meat companies act as if it's a given that this is going to be solved really soon. So as things are now, lab meat is a kind of catch-22. If you want to make a lot of lab meat efficiently, you need a big vessel. But it's really difficult and expensive to keep big vessels clean. And the bigger the vessel, the less efficient the cells grow. You can use perfusion to make your cells grow more efficiently, but perfusion is even more expensive and it doesn't scale. It uses way too much of that expensive growth medium. And making tons of growth medium is currently too resource expensive and bad for the environment, which defeats the whole purpose of lab meat. Some companies are aiming to make hybrid products instead. For example, they'll just make the animal fats in bioreactors and use that to make plant-based products taste better. Perfect Day alone raised $361 million. Perfect Day is a company making synthetic whey protein using fungus in a fermentation tank. They mix that with water, sugar, sunflower oil, and other ingredients to make a milk-like product. Even though this type of fermentation is typically way easier to do than growing meat in a bioreactor, their animal-free milk product currently costs about three times as much as organic grass-fed milk and about 10 times as much as regular milk. The optimistic of us may still assume that just like how Moore's Law allowed us to go from Macintoshes to tiny iPhones, we'll go from $50 lab chicken nuggets to $5 lab steaks. But Moore's Law doesn't apply to biological systems. And even if it did, Moore's Law is plateauing lately. It can't go on forever. Lab meat technology will probably improve, but at some point that progress will hit a plateau. Thinking that that plateau won't come before lab meat's cost is practical 
is a huge gamble. About $3 billion has been invested into lab meat so far. Yet, the available evidence does not guarantee that lab meat will be practical, profitable, or even good for the environment. Lucky for us, humans aren't like a bioreactor. We don't need to drink growth medium, we just need to drink enough water to stay hydrated. That's where this video's sponsor, Element, comes in. Element is a great way to add electrolytes and stay hydrated without any sugar. Many people don't realize that electrolytes are a big part of hydration and are important for maintaining energy levels, especially if you're fasting, doing a low-carb diet, or just losing electrolytes through sweat when you exercise. Rather than a pre-workout or caffeine, I usually just have some Element before my workouts. The other thing is that sometimes hunger can just be a craving for sodium, which is why I also have a pack if I'm starting to crave some snacks. Element tastes great, and there's no junk in it. It's just a good balance of electrolytes, sodium, potassium, and magnesium, a bit of flavoring, and some stevia. There's also a raw unflavored type if you prefer. If you go to drinklmnt.com slash what I've learned, you can get a free sampler pack with any purchase.